Hey everybody, welcome to Queen Comedy Podcast. It's James, and today I have a great person <laughs> for you. Because here's the thing: as comedians, we go through our whole career and we do this thing where we go, Oh, if I only had a manager, if I only had an agent, if I only had someone to help me, if I only had, you know, whatever. Instead, like we we put too much emphasis on outside help sometimes. And while it is good, and, and our guest is gonna talk to us about that. We have to develop first. I guarantee, I guarantee you he's going to say that too. He's going to say, you have to develop first. You have to know who you are on stage. You have to know what you're doing. But our guest today is a graduate from UCLA School of uh, Feature Film and Television. He's uh, uh, president. Of, he's been the uh, president of Acme Talent and Literary. Now he's uh, with Eris Talent. Uh, he's just great. Please welcome Adam Leland. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for that very brief introduction. I know. Nice, yes. It's, uh, you know. Well, what... if I read everything, we'd be here for the whole hour. I couldn't <laughs> do it. It would be, yes, because I am I am one of those old guys who has spent decades in the business, been a producer, an agent, worked at, at casting software companies. And now not only am I, a, not only do I represent stand-up comedians uh, as, a, as a talent agent for their commercial work, not for their TV or film work or stand-up work, right. just for the commercial work these days. Uh, but I also do stand up and I host shows. So yeah, that would have been a longer intro. But uh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. So so you get to you get to come at this from two two sides, right? Because you know what it's like to be a comedian. A but you yeah, well yeah, a lot of sides. But like for sure, in in the comedy world, a lot of us go and and I do writing too. But like a lot of us go, well, when I get a manager or when I get an agent, we'll all be famous or I'll be this or whatever. But you you do stand up and you've worked on representing people. Uh, it's, how, it's, how true is that? It's not true. Uh, it, well, the <laughs> thing is, you have to generate the 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 heat on yourself. You have to be undeniably talented for an agent to really say, "I'm going to help you." If you're just moderately talented and you have an interesting look, you you will get a small. You could get a small agent who may handle you for commercials and maybe television and film. Not going to be personal appearance. You're not going to get a stand up agent until you can make them a lot of money. And that's, that involves you marketing yourself for years. No right. one starts with a, with a standup comedy agent day one. And, uh, you know, and then the small agent will work for you. And then maybe you get something, this and that, but you have to really be proactive and very, very talented. And so in, in terms of being a standup comic, you got to be working on your material all the time. Now I go, and I think I may have mentioned this to you, James, I go to clubs every night of the week. Uh, I was just at, uh, look, I was just at the bourbon room last night, but I go, I go to the improv, the store, the, the factory. I go to uh, Ha Ha, the, the Comedy Chateau and Flappers, which I love Flappers. I produce at Flappers. I produce at Improv. And I go to the Hermosa Comedy and Magic Club. I go to uh, the Stand Up and Bellflower. I go to Long Beach Laugh Factory. I go to Ice House. I go every, and I go to a lot of the places like Fourth Wall for to watch open mics. And when I watch young comics, young or old, at open mics, I take note, oh, they're funny or they're almost funny. And then I'll see them again and again and again, because that's what they do. You do. And if they're not changing their material, if they're not trying to get better, I write them off. Done. Wow. It's not good. But if they're, if each time they're trying something different now at open mics, it's really hard to get laughs out of the audience right. and I get it. So I'm not listening for the laughs. I'm listening at the material and going like to myself, sometimes I'll go, hmm, oh yeah, that's funny. Or I might laugh, but uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but I get it, you know, it's subjective, but if they're really trying to modify their material to make it better, then I think they're terrific as a, as a performer. And I will, I follow them. And many times I say, I have 160 standups on my roster right now. Wow. It's a lot. And I'm, and I, I need a lot more, uh, in commercial world, commercial cast directors love the skill sets that standups have the ability to improvise and do things multiple ways as a standup you know you 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 if you have one set a five minute tight five let's say uh and you go to five different clubs to do it it's not going to be the same every time you're not going to do the same inflection you're, you're going to do it based on the audience reaction your mood the, the whatever and uh and when you're on a set of a commercial or even an audition they want multiple flavors of the same sentence right and not just pop a different word in the sentence but be different each time you do it. And standups can do that. And that's yeah. why I love it. And it's, uh, you know, I used to produce commercials and I would see who would get cast. And then, you know, as an agent for commercial actors, I see what the cast directors value. And I love handling standups. It's so great. And it's, you know, commercials is a bonus income. No one dreams of that. It's right. just like extra income to help you in your career to live while you have to 
you know, get ten dollars for your performance tonight at the improv, or if, you know, if you're lucky enough to get that ten dollars. <laughs> well, if you get a ten minute set in the in the uh, in the lab, that's the that's the bare minimum. That's ten bucks, ten minute set. That's their that's their process. Yeah. So. That's what I produce in the lab. So that I know uh, if I gave them nine minutes, they wouldn't get paid. Oh, wow. Yeah. So. That's, I, I, I did not know that. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I did the, uh, I did the uh, OR for the first time uh, a couple weeks ago uh, for, for the, the store sure. for the audition for the, for the potluck. So it was great. It was, but the set that I did, I know normally does really well, but that room just, it was just not feeling oh, it that night. Tough, I got right. my first big laugh right away. I was like, okay, I'm good. We, I, I know my opener will always get big, big laughs. Yeah. And then I started to go into my set and I did it and it just, it got laughs, but it wasn't the laughs that it normally got. And I was like, man, what's happening? And then I literally had a show the next day. I did the same exact set. Yeah. Everything. I was like, yeah. totally was like, different. Audio. In that room, in that room, you're all, all the other comics are there. Yeah. yeah. They have no vested interest in laughing at you. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they won't, even if they find it funny. And later on, they'll go, oh, yeah, that was a funny joke. But they're not going to have laughed in, in, in the moment. And it's it's a tough thing to, you know, when I first, I did started doing open mics you know, a long time ago. It was uh, difficult because uh, I, I only brought things that crushed and nothing, there was no reaction because they're all, everyone's yeah. a comic. And they're in their phones, they're swiping, they're making notes about their set. They don't care. It's just, you know, fuck it. I just, I tried stand up for the first time. And this is an interesting story. I was at UCLA as a student in the 80s. And I thought about doing stand up comedy. And I joined a, the comedy club at UCLA. And we would write material together. We'd get ready. We'd produce these big shows in the graduate student dorms where they could serve alcohol. And we would get like 300 people in there and we would book one headliner. That was a you know professional comic. We had Taylor Negron, who was great. I love him. I miss him. He uh, he uh, did an hour. He did a full hour, but we all did five minute opens, and I did my best five minutes in 1984. I think it was 84, and uh, and uh, you know I got some laughs because everyone was drunk, whatever. And then uh, after the show, we were all hanging out with the, with Taylor, and Taylor says to me, "Adam, you <laughs> not funny, not funny." You <laughs> You are, your life is too perfect. You have nothing to complain about. Just go live your life. And maybe if you suffer, come back and do comedy later. And it crushed me and I stopped and I never did comedy again. Oh. Uh, ultimately, I represented him for a few years in the, in the, in the nineties and early two thousands. And, uh, but then, uh, in uh, about 10 years ago, when I was working in software and not an agent anymore, I'd said uh, to myself, look, I've been married three times and divorced. What? I've suffered. I'm going to try this comedy thing. And that's when I tried it again. And, and, and unfortunately, Taylor had passed, so I couldn't invite him to come. But uh, uh, it was kind of right. But, but when I had seen him at a party uh, years later and I said, you remember that thing you said to me? He goes, I don't remember saying that to you. But I said that to all the young comics that I liked back then because I didn't I wanted to cut the competition. So. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is like you, you use material that you, that you know crushes and then in a, in a mic, it doesn't work. Or if there's, it's a mostly com comedic audience where comedians are there, they're not going to laugh. So you, that's the hard part about starting comedy is too many comedians go, I went to an open mic and I bombed because nobody laughed. No, you didn't really bomb. Nobody's there to pay attention to you. They're there to work out their stuff and try to see if it works. Yeah. Yeah, that's they, right. That's right. I mean, if if you, uh, I mean, there's paths in in Los Angeles that that you know it involves open mics, of course, but that's not where you're going to find out if you're funny. Yep. That's where you're going to get your reps in, get get used to uh, uh, being on stage and being comfortable with the mic and the mic stand. And I've seen so. I mean, it's comedy 101 to to know how to handle the microphone and the stand. And when I see someone that doesn't know how to do that. I know. Oh, you're so new. I mean, it's one thing to know the rules and then be and break them. It's fine. Like, you know, Bill Burr always, always is playing with the mic stand and he's leaning on the mic stand and he's doing the stuff. No one cares. No one's even thinking about him in the mic stand. But with a young comic who's pausing and not being funny it, when they're playing with the mic stand and sticking their finger in it and and leaving it in front of them. And, I, you know, I, I, it drives me nuts. You know, yeah. it's it, learn the rules. And then when you're good enough to break them, then you can break the rules. That's so, exactly right. Yeah. So for like for commercials, for comedians going to commercials and stuff, because I know yeah. like one of my friends, Willie Mack, he's in like a ton of commercials. I, I know, you, you know, Willie, he's yeah. in like 
I, I, I swear to you, I turn on the TV and I'm like, there's Willie, there's Willie, there's Willie. Like I do it all the time. And I'll, ta- I'll take pictures and text him and say, Hey, here's, I see you again. You know, he's like that getting that money, you know? So it's, it's good. Yep. What, do, what do they look for? I've never, I'm too ugly to be in a commercial, but is there, there's like, no there, such thing as being too ugly. Cause they take care. They take attractive. They take uh, real and they take characters. It's all, it depends on the role and the, and the, and the nature of the spot. So I don't look at someone and say, you're never going to book a commercial. I say, well, there's less auditions for you because you're weird looking. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, because the drop dead gorgeous guys and girls in their 20s, they're they're going to book all the time. They're going to get a lot of auditions. And and uh, but the the weird character fat guys with hair all over their face, there's going to be some stuff, but it's not every day. You know, you're not going to get Tide or Quaker Oats or 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 Ford Motor Company. You're not going to get the big the big commercials for the products that have to appeal to Middle America as oh this type of person buys this product, right? You're going to get the before and the before and after <laughs> or something, or whatever, or the or the anti character, whatever. But yeah, you can do it. Uh, but it's what they look for is just someone who is who is naturally interesting when they speak. And that's it. You have training in commercials uh, by having like one commercial workshop. There's like there's about t- five or ten of them in Los Angeles worth going to, and I, I have lists. Uh, I can provide them to your listeners if you. If yeah, you that'd be great. Want to send it to you later, but there's a list of them, and they're mos- mostly taught by working casting directors or people who have been in casting for a long time, and uh, they know the process. And it, the process has changed since the pandemic started. It used to be every audition had to be in person, every callback had to be in person, everything always, never an exception. And now it's most auditions are self-taped first time. So they give you a set of instructions. You tell, tape yourself like we're doing now on, on a Zoom thing. You tape yourself and then uh, um, it, you submit it. Uh, you just upload it to the to the uh, casting site that, that everyone uses. And then uh, if you get called back, it's a Zoom. It's a virtual audition. It's either Zoom or Hey Joe or one of these other casting virtual like like we're doing right now. And you'll there'll be just some other tiles on the screen from other the ad agency people, the casting people, whatever it is. But then you're as an actor, you're you're doing what they say to do. And that's it. And and then when you book, you book and you go to you go to work and you make a bunch of money. You don't have to be union. Commercials is primarily non-union these days. Uh there's about 30% union work. It used to be a hundred percent union work or 90% union work back in the uh in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, but there was this big actor strike in in 2000. It lasted six months against the ad in- industry, and after that, the ad- advertising industry said, ah, "We don't need to use union. This is not a skilled profession. It's just it's, we don't need these these great." So it's a long story, but uh, but uh, it shifted. But that means that a lot of stand-up comics that are not union that no, didn't plan to be actors, they can do commercials. And you make, you know, the, the lowest commercials that I submit on, it's 500 bucks a day and about $2,500 for one year of use. So you make 3000 bucks for a day's work is better than- That's amazing. Better than a night at the at the, at the store. You know what I mean? Better That's than amazing. bopping into three clubs in one night and going, wow, look, I made 250 bucks or whatever it is. No, no, it's, uh, it's good. And we like it. It's bonus income. And yeah. I, I'm happy to provide comics with bonus income it's the least stressful part of being an agent. When I was an agent for people for television and film, there's so much stress because when you don't succeed for them, they you feel guilty as an agent. They feel like, oh, my agent's bad, right? But when you do succeed for a client, they get a show, they get a series regular show, they get a big show, they get a big movie, and the big agencies come to them and they leave. Uh. I mean, like I put Seth Meyers on SNL. And three weeks after his first episode, he paid for seven years, but three weeks, because, uh, well, he might not have left if I had come to the first taping, but I tried, <laughs> I paid eight, I paid for eight first class round trip tickets for my staff, my, my theatrical agents to go and see Seth and support him. But a few days before that taping, the airplanes hit the World Trade Centers. It was 9-11 oh. and every plane in the country was shut down and grounded and we couldn't make it. But they still taped the show, and uh, ICM, I think it was ICM, uh, uh, stole him from me right away. I mean, I couldn't even get there before that happened. But, you know, he's like, oh, it's okay. They have Sandler, and and I, I kind of like them. And I'm like, all right, fine. And he paid me. But wow. uh, that kind of stuff, stress. So when I, got, when I sold my agency, I had it for 16 years. When I sold my agency in 2008, uh, it was because of a divorce and a recession, whatever. I said, I'm not going to do it anymore. 
but after 10 years in casting software, I worked with casting networks and breakdown services, actors access. And uh, uh, I was so bored with software. I had to get back into the agency side. Pandemic made it happen. I, I moved over and uh, uh, these uh, agency friends of mine said, uh, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I don't want to run an agency. I don't want to do the, I want to handle co comedians because that's what I know and love now. And I want to uh, just do the commercials. And that for me is so much fun. Wow. That sounds so, awesome. Yeah. It's fun. I, I remember when I first got to LA, uh, I did, I sent up for like central casting, you know, like the, the you, yeah. you just have to go wait down at like four o'clock okay. in the morning and wait in the line and whatever. I never, I never got a background spot ever, but I did work on it like as a PA yeah. and a, on a bunch of stuff or really? whatever. But so oh, I loved being a PA. It was so fun. You learn so much as a PA. I learned, you know, in the first few months after a graduate school, after I got my master's, I worked as a PA and I learned more in those months yeah. about production than you learn in a graduate school. Yeah. Doing films on graduate school, you learn more as a PA, yeah. uh, you know, and I, so I loved that. And then I, PA, production coordinator, production manager, producer, that's what I did. And I loved it. But, the, but it, uh, it, you know, it's freelance. And so you're going job to job and, you know, like you'll be working solid in, in 25 hour days for, for a month. And then you're in between nothing. jobs and you're doing nothing. And so the first few days in between jobs, you do all your laundry, you clean your apartment, you, you, uh, you call everyone that you can possibly think of to, to get your next job. And then you crack a beer and you turn on CNN and that's where you're at for like a week or two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. And then it's like, Oh, how many more beers do I have? You know, it's like, it's awful. And then, uh, so I didn't like the freelance world that way. I mean, it was good money. It's a trap. It's good money. But uh, so then I, you know, when I started an agency, I started it with my first wife, first of three, long set. You got to see my set. Okay. Uh, my first wife is an agent and we started an agency together in 93. And that was fun. It was full time and it was great. Uh, we ended up with 18 agents in Los Angeles and six in the New York office and seven divisions and thousands of wow. clients. So productive. And, uh, but, but like I said, stressful and, uh, and and uh 16 years took it, it took 50 years off my life what should a comedian be at when they start thinking about um commercial stuff like obviously you probably an open micers not ready to do that but well, maybe somebody it, five think, years in or whatever it, okay you know what i i uh any any level of comedian okay can look for a commercial agent because that's the first step in the whole process commercials easy to get because it's it's there are many of them that don't require a tremendous amount of skill. Okay. <laughs> Look at it. You watch commercials, you'll see someone go, hi, you know, and then they <laughs> they make a lot of money. And if they you can do that, whatever it is. Um I mean, look, there's there's sessions in commercial workshops that are called bite and smile, which is if you're doing a food commercial and they're giving you a cheeseburger to eat, you have to learn the technique to bite and smile and not swallow and not have food in your teeth and whatever it is. And okay. This is not a skilled profession. You can learn that in a day. So if you have one commercial workshop, you can do commercials. You just need good photos. And that's a headshot photographer. There's a lot of them out there. I have a list. And then and uh, and the online casting profiles that you need in Los Angeles are casting networks, which is sometimes known as LA Casting, but it's casting networks, and then Casting Frontier. They're owned by the same company now, but these are what casting directors use to cast everything. So if you're if you are someone who wants to be a performer and are starting and trying to, you're an open micer, you're just be, just beginning. You can look for a commercial agent. Take a commercial workshop first. That's the best best thing. Ha get, the, get the profile on there uh, so that when you're submitting to them, they know, oh, well, this person has a profile that I can start using today if I say yes, right? Mm -hmm. And that's it. But they're not going to be as successful, most likely, as someone who has some a lot more skill but uh one of the things in commercials that people need to know is that if they have more skills in their life like if they're a great tennis player or we're a college baseball player or they can water ski or barefoot water ski or skydive or do whatever these types of skills are those things are useful and valuable and sellable and marketable in the commercial world because they ask for them and when they ask for them and i don't have them i can't submit i'm like i, I don't have someone that jump ropes or you know or does competitive whatever's you know that's what they ask for but uh but almost all commercials when they when they send out the breakdown the the the, the uh, description of the role that they need for the spot uh many of them m many more than half of the roles say comedy 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 must wow. be great at comedy great at improv and you know they don't specifically say stand-ups although some of them do but when they say great at improv it means stand-ups as well 
because stand-ups do a lot of that. Anyone who does crowd work, that's yeah. improv. You know, right. so I was I was at the Bourbon Room last night. I still have my uh, my little thing here, uh, and and I had there was Tiffany Haddish and Adam Ray and Eliza, and they're all incredibly good at what they do. It was it was very solid, but there was they are great at crowd work, and every you know the, the better you are as a stand up, the better you are at improv and crowd work. There was this thirteen year old kid in the front row, and and every comic came up and went, "Is there a child here? How old are you?" And they just it became the night of you know we knew every comic was going to look at that kid and go, Oh, and then say stuff. And it was great. It was so fun. And so, you know, this kind of improvisational stuff is really valuable to a casting director and commercials because they know in a commercial, and this is something that every actor doesn't know that, uh, you know, you may get a piece of direction to say, okay, you did it this way. Let's try it this way. You know, and you try it. And every actor can do it one way and another way, but on a commercial set, you will be, uh, you'll get it the way that they wanted it. And then they'll say, all right, we're going to keep doing this. Give us different options. You're going to get a hundred different flavors. They're not going to wow. give you direction. They're just going to say, do it again differently. Do it again differently. They want choices in the editing room. And let's just say the sentence, and I did this commercial back decades ago. It was for the milk the milk board, right? So it was the, the sentence was, milk, it does a body good. And we had the actors say that a hundred different ways. But the act, one of the actors was like, all he could do was pop a different word. Milk, it does a body good. 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 And then they're done and they have no other flavor, <laughs> right? They have no other, but a, 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 a comic would be would come out there and do a different character each time. Yeah. I, I do it shy. I do it loud. I do it like, you know, uh, it, I would do it to, and the, and these comedians could do it a hundred different ways. And the cast and crew and ad agency and directors would be laughing behind the camera in, in, in video village where they're watching the, the tape. Yeah. They'd just be laughing. That's a valuable. And I realized back then someone who can do that, they can, they can make a lot of money in commercials and probably on stage as well. So it's uh yeah, that's the, that's the valuable skill set that they're looking for. And you know, if you if you look attractive, it's better. If you look, <laughs> if you look extreme, like me, <laughs> if you look extreme character, it's also good. If you're middle of the road, you're a middle of the road guy. Yeah, you're you're real to character. That's the category I put you in. Real to character, uh, you know, because there's that range. And uh, yeah, you book stuff. I got people that books. I got some. I got a, a one of my clients, and I hope he. Well, I mean, he might see this. Oh God, I don't know. Uh, his a good friend. He's he's a nice guy. His name is Kyle Kreis. He he. Uh, I love Kyle. Uh, he booked a he booked a commercial and and you look at me go not a lot of auditions probably but when they're right they're right and he booked something and uh and did it you know and i think he he's not doing commercials anymore but he's uh he uh uh he's a gr good guy and it tells it tells you right. i think you're kind of in that category you just don't have the long hair yeah no i don't yeah Ky kyle's got more character on me than i have than i think like i, I don't have as much character as, as kyle does i love kyle he's great uh, but yeah, <laughs> I, I feel like I look like everybody's dad or uncle, like that, uh, that guy. Right? What, like age I, range, what age range do you think you play? Me? I could probably play 30 to 40, somewhere in that range. I don't 40? think I could play any younger than that because I have like a little bit of gray hair. I got, yeah. People always think I'm late 20s to mid 30s, but I'm actually 42. But like I, they give me, I get that a lot. If I didn't have like this uh, little neck fat thing, Extra. I'd probably... Yeah. yeah, I could probably get away. I'm trying to lose the weight. So, but well, I think, I... you know, if you're in, if you're doing it, you age yourself up, say I'm 35 to 45, because that's oh. better because okay. a lot of people are actors inherently age themselves down, you oh. know, especially women. And and some guys, they, they'll say I'm 25 to 35, but I'm really 42. Right. And no, you're 35 to, to 45 or 38 to 48 and then uh, you look really good for 48 you know what i mean yeah. so you can you can do it um but when you're let's say i have a client that's 40 and they think they can do 28 um so i couldn't do 28 they get an audition, <laughs> for, they get an audition for a 28 year old role and they're competing against 22 year olds and a 42 year old and a 22 year old in the same casting session look like different uh living beings they look like yeah. different species you know what i mean you, they're not the same so they're not going to pick you but uh, but it's I think aging up uh, has been more successful for at least for uh, from my perspective.
That's smart. I'm probably going to take one of these commercial classes because I've never thought about that. Because I always, I always see like again, I see like my friend Willie and other people, and I go, oh, "Well, yeah. he's Willie's handsome. Like these guys are handsome. They're, you know, they're good. I'm not going to be able to. I ah, never mind. I'm not going to even try it." So there's a lot of characters out there. What you take one class, you look around the at, at the students, and you go, "Oh yeah, I fit in here. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I if I if you if you were represented by me and I got you an audition and it was in a live setting, which 20% of them are now it's still in like you know in a in a live uh, audition room and you look around the room the waiting room and you go oh yeah this is what i am you know because it's <laughs> there's a lot of me out here uh cuz there is you know and and because it, everyone buys products and when you're selling when you're in a commercial you're you're sale you're trying to sell the product that they're paying you to advertise so it's it, you think about the product you know if it's if it's uh if it's beer they want the good looking people that go to bars to pick right. each other up. So you might not book a beer, um, but in, in, unless it's a, it's an interesting campaign. I, I produced a hundred plus commercials back in, in, in the eighties with, uh, for, for Bud Light, um, uh, Bob Euchre, John Madden, Joe Piscopo, uh, and all the sports celebrities that were, that were back then. And there was a lot of weird looking people. Yeah, John, John Madden is a weird looking guy. Like, no offense, John Madden, I love him. Yeah, but it was so great. I mean, I his he 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 never flew on an airplane. He always took his bus to wherever he went. He had a, wow. has a bus had a staff. Yeah, on a bus. I remember that. So whenever I had to talk to him, I had to go onto his bus. It's it's like a giant uh, home on wheels. It wasn't a motorhome, but it was like a a double deckered hold. Uh, loved him and Bob and Bob Euchre, funniest man alive. You know, uh, you know, there's you can't have a five minute conversation with him without laughing continuously. Um, I did one commercial called the three, was it the three billionth case celebration? It was 1984 or whatever. But every one of those build light celebrities, every athlete, every celebrity was in that one commercial. Wow. In the same day, we all shot and we had, a you know, like 50 motor homes in the parking lot because uh, each, each one needed their own dressing room and place to stay and, and Euchre and Madden and everybody. And it's, I, I found it on online recently. It's still, it's on YouTube that, that commercial, but it's, wow. it's old and it's blurry, but it's because they, you know, technology back then. But uh, no, I loved the commercial world. I never planned to get into it. Most people don't plan to get into commercials. It's, you know, you plan to be a TV personality or a film personality or be a director or producer of tv your name's on the screen it's not on for t commercials so i had pr finished producing a film and i was in between jobs and someone said you want to work on a commercial and i'm like all right and i worked on a commercial and it was so much fun the professionalism of the crews and the and it was just so it, they spent a ton of money to do 30 seconds worth of material yeah. and it was on the air like two days later and i was I had just produced a film, took me like a year and a half to produce and shoot, and I didn't finish it for another year. <laughs> but the commercial cost 20 times as much money or more than that, and uh, was on the air two days later. It was, a, it was a Bud Light commercial. Truck Robinson was a, apparently a famous basketball player, and and the commercial, the tagline was, uh, you know, he, he came up and ordered a bunch of Bud Lights and then left. And uh, the waitress is like, that truck always stopping for a light. And that was the whole thing. And it was one 30 second spot. It aired during the NBA all-star game and never aired again. Wow. And it was so much fun to, to do that. I said, I'm going to do more of these because I got as an, as a production assistant on that job, more than I got as an associate producer on a, on a, uh, on a television series. Wow. Now, do you think yeah. that um, <laughs> comedians doing commercials is also helps them get like recognition or get, get that kind of like feather in their cap to get more things off of it? Uh, it depends on the commercial. Yes and no. Uh, sometimes the roles are so small, they're they're throwaway. They, you know, you, no one's going to recognize them, and maybe a handful of people will, but no one's going to buy a ticket to a show because, hey, I saw that guy in the background in the Bud commercial, right. you know. But there are some commercials that are so funny and interesting, and then when they see a, a, a promotion of this guy uh, at a local club, they will say, "Oh, I got to go see that guy," you know, and that's. It, but it depends. I mean, like I, um, uh, Stephanie Courtney, who's a groundling and who was, uh, who was, um, uh, uh, she is Flo from Progressive. Yeah, yeah. She was a client of my agency in 2008 when she booked that, and that she's still Flo from Progressive. Um, I didn't book her on that, just to, you know, and for clarity, I was her theatrical agent. Uh, my agency was her theatrical agent, but um, she was Flo, she's Flo from Progressive, and uh, that. If she, you know, she's still a groundling and she sells, they sell tickets to the show 
that she's in because, oh my God, I want to see Flo, right? <laughs> uh, so that's it. But it's it's not usually uh, what what makes someone uh, a, a draw. It doesn't necessarily help the, the bottom line ticket sales. But if someone becomes a spokesman for a product, it could be cool. But it's usually just it's just the uh, the buffer uh, income that helps uh, that helps an actor a stand up survive to the next paycheck because actors don't go from job to job to job instantly. There's right. there's you know you don't you don't want to have to drive for Uber. Or, yeah. or deliver for Postmates. If you can book a commercial, work on set one day and make the same amount you'd make for Uber in a month, you know what I mean? Right. Or two months or three months or a year because it's it's lucrative. Commercials are lucrative. All right, my... my uh, All right, one uh, more question. We'll, we'll get you out of here. If you could go back in time, like when you started stand-up or you could go back in time and give stand-ups advice, what one piece of advice would you give to yourself or to someone starting out in, in stand-up? I would tell a, a beginning or, or, or moving up stand up to to be constantly writing, constantly watching stand up. Go to open mics, even if you don't have an appointment, even if you're not, you know, you didn't get into the slotted. Watch the others, see what they're doing, write as much as possible, and and uh, you know, get up on stage as much as you can and be the best, nicest person. Be encouraging to them because you never they may end up being producers of shows that you want to book you on those shows. Be nice to them. Be their friends. Unless you're doing a roast intentionally, because that's a that's fun. That's a fun thing. I, I'm not good at doing it myself, but I like watching good roasts yep. and good judges on roast battles. Uh, the judges are the best part of some roast battles. Um, but uh, you just just be the nicest person because if you if you're nice and easy to work with and getting better, then people will want to help you. They'll want to book you. And uh, and don't be afraid to be assertive in asking uh, uh, bookers of shows, uh, what's your process for booking? What would you need for me to book me on the show? You know, and, and don't say how much money will I get? Because most of the time you're not going to get money. And if shows are officially bringers, like you have to bring four people or five people or you don't get on stage, I suggest don't do those shows. I, you, I love you. I love you just for that comment. Thank yeah, you. Don't do those shows. It's not It's not fair to you or to any to the three of your five people that come and won't see you. It's not fair. Yeah. You know, like I produce shows and I say to my people, I encourage you to promote, but I don't require you to promote. If you don't bring anyone, it's fine. I'm the producer. I promote. I don't get the audience. It's my fault. You're going to be there. You're going to just be funny and show up on time, be funny and stay. If you can't stay the whole time, I mean, in some shows, it doesn't matter if you stay the whole time to watch the rest of the comics or to be there at the end. But my shows, I require it because I invite industry. Right. And I want them to be able to talk to the comics afterwards and say, I loved you. Oh, this is great. Blah, blah, blah. Meet them and make eye contact. If you come and perform and leave, they can't do that. And then you, you, you miss out on the networking part of it. And there's a lot of comics leave and there are audience members and there may be industry in your audience that you don't know that wanted to talk to you, but you're gone. Yeah. So you stay, you take pictures with some people in front of the, the step and repeat. You take, a, you know, if you have merch, you you sell your merch, whatever. Um, I, I still find that sleazy, but whatever. If you have merch, it's great. You know, if you have like a beer koozie or a, or a T-shirts or something, go ahead, sell it. Uh, pins, whatever. Some people like that. Mugs, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't. Uh, Here's here's my here's my mug. It says it says uh, it was given to me by a client, world's greatest agent. There you go. Uh, I never booked that client on anything, but he gave me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you probably are the world's greatest agent because like you really do seem to care. Like, and you're being honest. Like, hey, don't go to bring. I hate when I like ask somebody, reach out to a producer, and go, hey, what's uh what you know what's your process? What do you need for me to see about booking? And they're like, well, yeah, I'll book you, but you need to bring five people. And you're like. You've been running this show for two years. Like, why do I need to bring five people? Like, yeah. what's, well, it's what's hard. happening? It's, it's hard. I mean, when you first start out in stand up and uh, you, you do a bringer, you have friends that have never seen you do stand up and they come. You can bring right. them. When I did my, my first show was after I did a level one class at Flappers University many years ago. And I didn't realize you had to do a show at the end of the class. I was just taking the stand up thing just, just to get, make my lectures at UCLA better. I teach at UCLA 30 years. I've been teaching a class, a business class for actors called The Working Actor. And, uh, but they put me in a show and they say, it's a bringer, bring people. And I brought 27 people to the show and the club uh, management went, oh, we like you. Oh, yeah. you, should, you should do more stuff here. Come, come take level two, take level three, four, go take the hosting class. Keep coming. And, you know, I, I teach there now and it's, it's fun. And it's, uh, but bringers are, it's, it's, 
the longer you're in, the harder to keep asking for favors from friends. So yeah. it's harder for you to be involved in bringers after your first year in comedy. So I, so I say, don't, don't get involved in it as much. I mean, look, if you really need the, the stage time and they say bring people and you have five people on your list that will come, go ahead, do it, whatever. But, uh, you know, and tell them if I'm not funny, you can laugh. I want them to book me again. And I want to get good. You got to get good tape. You got to get good. And the tape is only good if there's laughter, Yep. you know, and, uh, and, you know, getting good tape off of uh, in a set is hard because sometimes you'll either get the laughter too loud and the, and your volume's too low and it's echoey. Yep. I see it. All, I, you see everything on social media. You get it. So when I do my shows, I make sure that to get, have a videographer, Kita Mascaro, who is a good standup and a great videographer and producer, he, he does my taping and he plugs right into the soundboard. So he gets oh. the great audio from the mic and also from the audience. So you hear the laughter. Some tapes I, I get from some clubs, you'll, you'll, You'll hear the the uh, the 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 co- comic really well, and then the Why joke. Laughter. Happened, there's a pause, and you you don't hear much laughter. Yes. But it, there was a lot of laughter in the room, but you don't hear it. Yeah. You know, and that's that's disappointing because the people that are listening to the tape are going to think they bombed. Yeah, you know? that's that's the worst part. I've had two great shows where I filmed it, and it was that exact thing of like my stuff is good, but you hear a little. You can hear the laughter, but it's so low. Cause it didn't pick up right. And I'm like, man, ah, this was the tape too. Like, you know, and you're trying to constantly get that tape. Of like, so people know, well, yeah. thank you so much. Where can people find you? Where can they look up your stuff and be able to reach out to you if they are excited or want to try being a commercial? Uh, uh, get that well, they can, they can email me at Adam at Aris talent agency.com. It's very simple. Adam at Aris talent agency.com. Uh, they can find me on, on, uh, on Instagram and, uh, as Acme Adam. I think I'm also the same name, Acme Adam. Acme was the name of my first agency. Acme Adam on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, or just my name, Adam Liebline on Facebook. I'm old, so I'm on Facebook. You know, I promote <laughs> my shows. I promote the shows I do monthly. My dog almost bit me. I promote the shows I do monthly um, on uh, on all the social media channels. So that, you know, if they end up following me, they'll know what I do. But yeah, uh, yeah they can email me and I'm, I'm happy to respond to every comic that calls me. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Adam. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Please go like and subscribe. Go check out Adam's stuff. I, I'm definitely going to go. I just was not a, a, a thing that I thought about, but now I'm going to go try it. Yeah, try a commercial it, yeah. and see, see what happens. Let's see what happens. Who, who knows? Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much. Have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.